We are live. Good to see you today, my EOS podcast friends. I have a fun show for you today. I have Crypto Tim on the EOS podcast for the first time, and we're going to talk all about the interesting things that are going on in EOS currently and uh, what's what's happening. So, Tim, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Crypto Tim. Uh, I am a EOS crypto personality. I started out in crypto maybe a couple of years ago and uh, just out of interest, uh, then came across EOS and was just sort of blown away, uh, not only by EOS's possibilities, uh, but by Dan Larimer's history uh, and everything that he's done with BitShares and Steam. Uh, so from there, as look, I work full time as an accountant. Uh, and I just started to make videos in my spare time and never really expected too much to come of it. Uh, but apparently people liked them. So I just sort of ran with it and, and grew the channel to here I am to here I am now. Um, I listen to so much uh, EOS sort of podcasts, your podcast, Brandon, uh, others, everything EOS uh, religiously sort of all the time, especially when I'm driving to and from work. And uh, I just breathe in the knowledge and uh, give back to the community uh, what I can as well. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Cool. Well, uh, it's been, I, I watch your material also. I, I like your show. I like uh, the everything EOS, EOS weekly. There's only like a few that I really, that I really pay attention mm. to. So um, yeah, EOS yeah, weekly is awesome. Man. Yeah, it's a great one. They just had a, they just had an interesting one about liquid apps. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit um, today, but uh, I always start off the show with what you think's most interesting going on in EOS. So yeah, what's most interesting to you right now? Okay, so this is a little bit of a background to my answer. Uh, so I actually think that, like, contrary to popular belief, digital, when Bitcoin first came around, people were trying to fit a digital currency in the analog world. And there's massive problems with using a digital currency where we currently have, like, cash and bank electronic, which is really just digital representations of cash. So I think what's going on with the else right now, what we see with the explosion of gambling dApps and now with what's happening with games planning to come like mythical games and those sorts of things are the most interesting thing right now because they're using a digital item, digital cash, you know, on the blockchain, digital items uh, in a digital world. And the most simplest implementation of that uh, is like the gambling because it's digital, it's online gambling and you're using an online money for it. So, of course, that's why it's worked so well. That's why it's just the gambling is just blown up because it just happens so, so not melds so nicely together. And we've seen the problems with uh, using, having online items with things like Second Life and, um, things, items not being verifiable in any way, shape or form and just owned by the gaming companies. Uh, so this is where uh, blockchain in, in EOS specifically is really well um, able to sort of fit in that niche and fulfill a real need there. So I think these games that are coming out that are, the games are not actually on the blockchain themselves. So they can be fully functioning, great, fantastic games that we're used to. Uh, but with the digital items themselves on the blockchain. So you can really get some real value just by playing a game. Uh, that's what's really, I think, that's most exciting uh, in the sort of whole EOSphere right now. Yeah, absolutely. And that, I haven't heard it put like that before, but that does make a lot of sense. Like, and because we've had these digital worlds for a, a while and some really immersive ones like World of Warcraft and uh, Second Life and things like that, where people just get sucked in and they're there forever. But now the addition of like, digital money or digital tokens or digital items that are provably unique that's a whole game changer because that's like you know that's like kind of the window to have to you have to come out of your game sometimes because uh there's there's the non-fungible things are in the real world they're not really in the uh they're not within games mm. much. but once you add that money or non-fungibility to the digital world like you're talking about that is that is really exciting um i just played high fidelity i've been playing high fidelity and playing some vr just to uh, keep up with things and high fidelity is what a killer game and interaction mm. it's very uh so you, you're at you're an avatar and you're vr so you're in this crazy world 
And there'll be like, you know, groups of people congregating in the same way that they would in real life, you know, like as you walk up to a conversation, it kind of gets louder and you kind of need to find your place within the circle so other people can hear you. It's like the same, same, these weird social dynamics carry over that makes it seem really uh, realistic. And when high fidelity adds EOS and money and non-fungible items, uh, you're right. I mean, that's going to be, it's going to change the whole way the world interacts. I mean, that's pretty, it's pretty wild to think about. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's just, you know, just imagine you're in this virtual world and you actually need to go through this virtual world. I saw the demonstration for high fidelity. It looks amazing. And there's only like, five of this item in a particular part of this online virtual reality world and you can see them on the blockchain but where are they you know in the world they're verifiable and you need to go through and find it and you know how much are they going to be worth it's yeah it's really it's really amazing definitely yeah it, it adds in all kinds of um like different dynamics of work that you might do within the digital world to gain to gain money that's that's actually usable. I mean, you could be just someone who goes and collects some certain type of item, or you could almost be like a miner, like a legitimate miner, like you're going and uh, you know pulling certain stones and bringing them back and, and selling them for people to mm. build stuff out of. I mean, there's all all the different yeah, economies that pop up. Mm. It, it becomes yeah, it becomes pretty pretty interesting. Um, yeah. What do you think as far as uh, as far as the games that you have you played any of the games that are out right now like maybe EOS Knights or um, have you or anything interesting out there like that? I've I've seen EOS Knights. I haven't actually played that one so far. I've been right into the into the gambling daps just because I've done a lot of reviews, had quite a few sponsorships from from all of them. Um, so I've been getting into those. Uh, but yeah, not so much on the on the EOS Knights or those. Uh, how did do you played them? No, I've I've played uh, the most recent thing. I haven't played EOS Knights. I've just just uh, watched videos of other people playing it. I've played uh, Pixios lately though, and have that, that's a fun interactive game. I kind of uh, missed the first. I watched the first round of um, Pixel Master. I think was what the first one was called, um, and then so I wanted to be earlier in Pixios. So I've been messing around with that. Mm-hmm. That's a fun. That's a fun. Um, fun one it's it's interesting to see your stuff get painted over you kind of expect like oh i found this like space over here i'm gonna put something here no one will mess with it but it's like that's part of the fun game is if you see someone's thing it's like fun to paint over it because you know they're gonna probably come back and repaint over it at some point um and then you make Mm. extra pixels so yeah that 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 one's fun for me yeah Mm. Yeah, yeah, I covered the original Pixel Master when it came out. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think this one's, I've been keeping an eye on it. I haven't been interacting too much with the, the, this Pixel game, but people aren't getting so carried away with this one, mm-hmm. So, which is a bit nice, you know. I'm seeing a bit more restraint. With Pixel Master, it was just like seeing the Telegram group and people were going to, you know, pay off their mortgage, you know, within the next 48 <laughs> hours. Yeah, yeah. I think, and it yeah. just went, it just went nuts, yeah. People have gotten a lot, have more restraint, partly probably the bear market and partly everyone's seen all the ICOs and things like kind of, you know, people are starting to realize what real value is a little bit more, you know, as they, as we learn these lessons along the way. So yeah, that's funny to see for sure. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So how about in, in general EOS, as far as like the EOS I, IO blockchain, um, there's a couple new things that have come out lately. Um, there is the uh, liquid apps. Have you? Did you get to see the EOS Weekly on that? And what do you think about that? Yeah, I saw the, the, the EOS Weekly on that. Um, congrats to EOS Weekly. That's another show that I watch every single week. Uh, they're yeah. fantastic. I can't wait for my new his next episode to come out with that. He puts a lot of effort into creating those. So um, yeah. mad props to him. Yeah, uh, that's that's something that's fantastic. And like he was saying, uh, it's because it's Bancor that we have really good faith that that is going to work really well because the Bancor team have a very good reputation. And I know from hearing the interview with them as well uh, that they were dying to come over to EOS actually because they had so many problems on Ethereum. They really felt the pain of having transactions fee and the latency on Ethereum as well so they're dying to come over to EOS so now I think they're here they're like wow we can do so much on here and that's sort of letting their talents and their their experience and skills sort of bloom because they're not restrained anymore by all of 
apply those two things on Ethereum mostly. So uh, that that it really literally could be a, a game changer. And I think being able to have the block producers because they're, I mean, partially because of the bear market, they're itching to have another revenue stream sort of come out, you know, with all of the sister chains and everything like that. But this allows them to focus more on the EOS mainnet, which is where the whole community is, where you're going to get the most, the best traction, where apps can really release and already have, you know, hundreds of thousands of token holders. Um, so this gives them another area to focus on and really, um, create value for the community by providing cheaper resources. Definitely. Um, I think it, yeah, it's, it's a fan, it's a fantastic thing. Yeah, can you definitely. give, can you give a kind of explanation for people in your own words of, of what it, what the uh, liquid apps does or attempts to at least? So let's, yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try the best I can. I don't understand too much. So it's basically like, it's kind of like a, a DAP layer that DAPs can plug into. So if we have our base layer here and everything right now is sort of plugging into that, the DAPs are plugging into that and they're all competing for resources and the resource is getting more and more expensive because as there's more DAPs, you know, the, the limited supply of things like CPU is just driving, driving up um, this, the scarcity of it. Uh, so liquid, DAPs, what I understand, it plugs into that base layer and then the sort of DAP service providers that sit on that layer then provide all of the resources uh, to those DAPs that plug into that uh, liquid DAPs. Uh, so, and th this is also, I understand, I'm not quite sure exactly how it works, but there's a revenue stream in that for the block producers as well. I think it's like a separate currency, a separate EOS currency as well. So they can be getting revenue from EOS as being a block producer and also revenue from providing resources to dApps on the liquid dApps layer, which then means that for the dApps, that's like hands off for them. Our resources are taken care of. We just pay some fee to the block producers and they're going to manage it for us. So they're like a DAPS, yeah, they're literally a DAPS service provider. If you think about an internet service provider, my internet's slow, I go to the, the internet service provider and say, hey, my internet's slow, fix it. You know, I don't need to worry about all of the goings on underneath that. I just go to my service provider and go, here, give me more. Oh, it's going to cost more money. Okay, you know, another $20 a month or something like that and I get more bandwidth. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I, my that's that's a great that's a great explanation, and it sounded it sounds to me like the um, block producers. I mean, eat, those contracts are going to be in the same way that you meant to mention an internet service pro provider. Those contracts are going to be negotiated um, independently of of the block of the kind of the blockchain. Like each block producer will say, "This is the infrastructure we have to offer. This is how much we charge," and there will be competition between the block producers. Um, to be running those nodes. And so uh, yeah. that, that's good too, because that'll drive the price down for the uh, dApps also. Mm. And I just want to add here as well. Mm. So you might, if you make this internet uh, analogy as well. So if like to everybody who's using the EOS blockchain right now, if you are handling keys, hardware wallets and things like that, just, I don't know if anybody had a computer back in the eighties when it first came out, but my dad bought me like one of the first PCs that was available because he used to work for a computer company and we used to go into DOS and change directories and, and all these sorts of things in DOS and do all these, these stuff in there. And it was all very difficult. So right now on EOS handling private keys, that's just like the DOS moment back in the computers with the eighties before windows and everything became clickable and all this stuff. So, you know, in hopefully not too long, if, if you are somebody that was there from the start handling private keys and, and interacting directly with the blockchain the way that we do and account creation, all these sorts of stuff, the way that it is now, that's going to be like you're a DOS sort of advanced user of a computer that you can go in behind like Windows, what's going to be like the Windows of EOS and all these sorts of things. And these going to have these service providers like blockchains and stuff that you're just going to sort of pay a fee to and they're going to look after things for you. Uh, so if you 
like learn as much as you can now about doing all of these advanced functions because you know a few years down the road and things you're going to be head and shoulders over anybody else because they're not going to know about these sorts of things oh i just downloaded a, a, a dap an, an app from the store and i started using it what's a private key do you know what i mean uh, so yeah, definitely learn as much as you can now because it will not only will it serve you well now, but it will serve you well into the future as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a great, that is a great analogy because people aren't going to go back once, once kind of this, this layer is hidden, people won't have a reason to go back and learn it. It'll really only be the really uh, technical people who have some sort of use, but uh, in the future, people won't understand or care about this. And so we do get a good opportunity to see under the hood and, and know how it works and know why decisions are being made. So it's, that's part of what I love about it. I, I'm sure you also, that's why I do the podcast is just because it's so cool to learn all of this. It feels like um, there's just unlimited amount of learning and every day I'm learning something new. Uh, and and, mm. and it's always so surprising how, smart the community is it kind of like blows my mind like the liquid apps thing that came out i was like oh my god who thought of this like who are who are these people that are doing this it's like it's just kind of mind-blowing how uh, advanced and you know another shout out to bancor it's, it seems like a really cool idea um i'm i'm excited about that and, and it changes the game a lot for side chains which is which is something that uh, has been recent in the in the EOS news um, because um, a lot of side chains have popped up and they're all over the place and there's all kinds of um, opinions about those and so let's get into side chains there's there's a few of them um, so yeah yeah absolutely so let's sort of step back and give my overall arching opinion on on these sort of side chains and fork chains and everything like this so it's good to create new things. Like I'll never sort of say bad about somebody that's doing something new and trying something new and trying something different. But as a community, we need to realize that there's limitations to the amount that the current crypto community can sort of split up and still retain value within a particular um, digital asset. So if we have a digital asset that is EOS, the only way that value is retained in, in terms of actual monetary value is if there's a decent level of liquidity, people buying and selling this all the time on exchanges. So unless we can in some way, shape or form, at least unite around that, we can't really expect to see too much price appreciation. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of members of the community that just are in this sort of for the money. You know, they want some good value from EOS. I want good value from EOS. I'm sure everybody that's watching this show does. That's why you made the original investment. Now, as a secondary thing, we have the technology which we find really amazing. So we say, let's experiment and let's try different side chains, let's try different things because we're having trouble on EOS because there's problems. So yes, we want to do that too. So it's just striking the balance between being amazed by the technology and amazed by all the different things we can do and different chains that we can make and, and different things that we can try and also retaining the value by uniting around a, a sort of central almost chain, which is almost a little bit counterproductive to a decentralized society and sort of trying to make ourselves, you know, some good returns on our investment. So it's not an easy thing to manage. And that's why you get all these different uh, viewpoints and maximalists and people that are just sort of true to one vision. But it all comes down to the fact that in my eyes, where is the community? So if you're building something, You've got to have people interacting. You've got to have people trying it, people doing different things with it, people testing it um, to make sure that, you know, if you have 100,000 users that it doesn't break. And the only way that you do that is to get the community involved, get them to have fun, get them to make some money, get them to trade with each other, all these kinds of things. So if you're building, if you're fractionalizing the community and building out way too many different chains, you're never going to be able to stress test things. You're never going to be able to really test the scaling of any one particular chain technology 
so that you can really gauge if things are actually freaking working. Um, so one of the great things about EOS is because it was one of the first, because with Ethereum, everybody tried to bring out this coin and this coin and this coin was going to do all these different things and this massive fragmenting of, of different coins, even the gambling dApps, they all made their own coins, which they use for gambling. Now, there's no liquidity, there's no, there's not many people using them, all these kinds of things. So when EOS Bet came out, I thought it was such a pivotal moment, not only for EOS, but for crypto in general, because finally we saw a, an application that thousands of people were using every day, finally scale. And it was finally stress tested and finally worked. And there was some CPU issues and stuff, but things were worked out as this sort of went along. And finally, we got some apps that had real users every day. Um, and from there, you know, the value was seen and the, the gambling applications were making money and some gamblers were winning, some were losing. That's how, that's how it works. Uh, and that's why we had the explosion. And people say, well, I'm sick of gambling dApps. Yeah, but it's the, the worldwide gambling industry is worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, if you include the black market, hundreds of billions every year. So people will never stop gambling. And if we can make EOS IO the home of worldwide online gambling, that brings so much value to the ecosystem. So um, I probably strayed a little bit from the side chain things, but I think now if we somehow find a way to sort of retain some sort of unification around EOS and retain the community so we can continue to um, bring out new dApps and, and stress test them and have the community really use them as soon as they come out um, by retaining the EOS community without trying to splinter it. Because if we splinter too much and try to spread out things too much over all these different chains, um, then it's going to be difficult to test the scaling of anything and really get any kind of value from anything. Uh, so coming back with the, to the liquid dApps thing, hopefully this will help to unite people back into sort of EOS while bringing scalability and ease of use uh, to the EOS blockchain itself um, and get people to use it uh, while making it simple for, for all of the apps and everything as well. While we still have the side chains as well, uh, experimenting with different things, but it, just remember as a user, you're never going to be able to test things just as well on a side chain as you will on the EOS chain, because that's where all of the users are. That's what people want to use. That's what people have invested their hard earned money into. And that's why like the predominantly most of the, um, block producers, developers have invested the block one, have invested most of their time and effort into. So let's try to retain focus on EOS um, while doing some experimenting. But if we go too crazy and build too many side chains, it's just things aren't going to work so much. They're just not going to work as much. So that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. no, I mean, that's, that's a pretty comprehensive that's answer. A, that's a that's a great answer, um, and the kind of a core takeaway there is this idea that <clears throat> we like the community is built around the EOS the EOS blockchain, and that's where that's where it is, and and the the token velocity and the users and the ability for DApps to be tested and and put to a test on the EOS chain is kind of what gives it its power. So uh, if I was a DApp and I want to launch, I want to launch where the users are and the users are on EOS and that's where all the good tools are and the good wallets and et cetera. So um, it gives it a huge leg up, which is, which is cool. Um, I almost see the sister chains as just like a, this healthy competition. That's just like, don't, don't fuck around on the main chain. Like, you know, they, we, people can all leave and go to, to Talos if, if something uh, you know, if, if you make some horrible misstep, I mean, or if you do something that seems, um, you know, if the block producers were to collude and start reversing transactions or something, then like the whole community has somewhere to go that's been built. Um, so it's kind of like this healthy competition, but uh, 
where I started to realize where I don't think that the sister chains and these extra chains come into play too much is when I have, I have a tail I have Talos and I have a Talos wallet and uh, you know, some apps have launched on Talos, but it's just not within my workflow to ever switch blockchains, use a different wallet, get into a different DAP, kind of whole different ecosystem. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a process. And so, uh, so even though like I'm, I like Talos and I think it, they're doing some interesting things and experimenting the, the, uh, how often I use it. It's like almost, I don't really use it because there's too much going on on EOS. And so, um, yeah, I think there's good momentum. And so I tend to not, I think that the, uh, in social media, I think that the sister chains and side chains probably get a lot more, uh, um, seem a lot more relevant than they are maybe. Um, and that's just a guess. I don't know what the numbers are. Um, but I think they, they have a louder voice on social media maybe than their actual transactions that are going on. Um, so, yeah, 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 exactly. And it becomes like an ideal, like we have an ideal of Telos with its, you know, fixes for governance and they sound great. So we say, yeah, Telos is good and everything on social media, but then how often do you actually go in and use it? That's the thing. Um, because there is that friction, you know, I've got my accounts on the house, I've got everything set up. I've got, I've got my accounts. I've got my premium name accounts now as well. And I've got all my keys. I've got my hardware wallet. It's all set up nicely. You know what I mean? And then to say, okay, now we've got Telus and we've got some things happening on there as well. So now, you know, put in as much effort on EOS that you did just there on Telus again. And, you know, for the average user, we're trying to make this as easy as possible. And that just makes it a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things are, I mean, things are difficult enough just, just for me, you know, on the else, let alone the average user that doesn't spend as much time um, as some people like you and I, I'm sure, on blockchain things, you know, on a weekly basis. So, yeah, it, it really does add that extra layer of, um, of difficulty and friction and having to learn something else and all of these different things. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely which is why it's so hard to bring a community over to something new. Yeah. It would take, it would take some sort of precipitous event to like send people somewhere new, which would be, which would be a huge blow to, you know, crypt, like DPoS in general, if, if all of a sudden there yeah, something exactly. happened. Yeah, exactly. So um, <clears throat> I follow uh, the te Brandon Bloomer's Telegram channel and they just, he was just talking about, um, announcements coming soon which they've been talking about but they he was talking about a hardware wallet coming from block one and um he said specifically that the reason that block one didn't um announce a wallet off like in the beginning was because they didn't want to compete with all the other wallets that were going to come out and offer good things it's kind of like if block one came out with a wallet what's the incentive for all these other people to build creative wallets so i thought that was kind of a cool take um What's your take on block one, where they're at, what they've done, what they have planned? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I love all the different viewpoints that you get from people about block one um, in the community. So my personal thoughts is that, um, look, I think from the token sale right at the start and to the launch of EOS, they do this stellar job and an absolutely fantastic job. They were upfront with people, uh, which is so rare when it comes to ICOs. They said, you know, this token has no real value. It might, the people might launch, the community might launch a chain, but we're not responsible for it. They were really upfront with what you were actually buying as an EOS token. Uh, and they delivered um, the EOS IO software, you know, smack bang right on the day that they said they were going to release it. Um, there were some hiccups at the start, but the more decentralized things are, uh, the more chaotic they tend to be um, in reality. That's always what tends to happen. So um, mad props to all the community and all the block producers that launched it. Um, you did so well considering, you know, what a bumpy ride it was at the start. Um, on to now, um, I would say that, I mean, the number one thing that I'd like to see come from Block One more is better sort of communication. And this year we're starting to see that. Um, you know, we're starting to see the 
Brendan Bloom, you know, on Telegram and on Twitter, um, really sort of be more vocal in the community and they want to get back into more governance and everything like that. Um, that's really fantastic. Um, I understand that it's taking them longer than was expected uh, to be releasing the next things yet. You know, the block one wallet. Um, that's the first I heard about a hardware wallet um, as well. Uh, but from my understanding, they're trying to be legally compliant, which in the United States right now is very, very difficult, especially with all the uncertainty about regulation um, that's there. So no wonder it's taking them a long time to do anything. Um, so I think all in all, um, Block One have been really good. They've been fantastic. You've got to also consider they're a startup organization too that just raised a lot of money. Um, and being an accountant, um, I know that if you've got a lot of money, a lot of people tend to think, okay, now lots of things are going to be happening because you've all got money. But it's all about people. So you've got to get people to do things in your organization. And, you know, if you just, if you just hired, you know, like what do they have a hundred devs or something like that? Yeah. Um, in, you know, a fairly short space of time, are they all very useful right at the start? No, they're not. Um, they've got to be trained up. They've got to be doing the right thing. Dan Larimer is a very busy man. I'm sure coordinating all of his team and trying to get all his team up and, and running. And then there's the legal uncertainty as well. So, from us, you know, we just have to be patient, really. And I know you probably lots of people hear about this on and on over and over again, but we just really have to be patient and understand that just because you made, um, you raised lots of money, doesn't money just doesn't make things happen out of thin air, just like that. People make things happen and people take time to build things. Uh, they do take a lot of time, especially when they're new, innovative things uh, in an ecosystem which just hasn't been done before. There's no guiding principles. Oh, we'll do the similar thing like was done before. Uh, everybody's making things up pretty much as they go along. Uh, so, yeah, um, look, I have full faith in them and I think um, Dan Larimer has always done a great, fantastic job in, in the past and he will continue to do a fantastic job leading the sort of way with Block One. Um, and being the sort of guiding light and uh, don't lose faith, you know, uh, because it, the things are coming from block one. I know, I know they are for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Let me, let me read that uh, this because it came out just a, a few minutes ago. Um, Brandon Bloomer in telegram said after much consideration, we want to release the wallet in a way that empowered all existing ESIO wallets and didn't compete with them. We landed on a solution we're excited about. In the process of deeply exploring private key management, we realized that no existing solutions met adequate security thresholds, so we began working with a leading hardware manufacturer to create the ability for all EOS IO wallets to secure their EOS-based assets with a higher degree of security than what previously existed. No issues with Apple at all. Dan just drawing large-scale conclusions as always. That's why we love him. So, yeah, it sounds like they... Um, I mean, to me, that sounds like they're, they're working with a hardware supplier and they're trying to get something that integrates all the other wallets. I mean, that's really exciting. Um, and I know that uh, I talked with EOS New York, Kevin at EOS New York, they're also doing a hardware wallet. Um, and Kevin went a little deeper into kind of their thought process behind it. And with EOS New York's hardware wallet, they're saying that, um, you know, we don't want this, this isn't going to be like your Trezor, where it's just like, you know, you're just going in and kind of, um, just managing your money basically or your accounts or it's, it's it's eos new york specifically says we don't want you to just set this in the safe it's not a cold storage for your it's like a something that you use every day and you interact with the blockchain with it so uh what that means specifically in the user interface i don't know but it sounds like uh possibly block one maybe taking that approach to it interacts with all wallets um so it's gonna be interesting to see hopefully they remove a lot of the layers as far as having to manage keys for all the, you know, and almost like possibly uh, maybe we'll see something kind of integrated, like what scatter does where you just plug this into your computer and it's your passport to the, um, to the blockchain, you know? So it could be really interesting. Definitely. Yeah. I heard about the uh, EOS New York hardware wallet. I heard, uh, them talk about it. Um, 
just recently. Uh, and as they said, it's called, I think it's called the Metro, isn't it? So you take a Metro, like you take a Metro card with you and that's, you can go anywhere in the city. You mm -hmm. take your EOS Metro with you, you can go anywhere in EOS, no matter where you are. Uh, that it's, itself is a fantastic thing. The, the idea that you could have the Metro just on your keychain and you can plug it in with full security, uh, identifiable to you with some kind of password, passcode, maybe even some kind of biometric, and that's it. You know, you can go anywhere um, as long as you have it with you. Uh, that's a fantastic, it's a really good thing. Um, absolutely. And we need more of those sorts of things there. The focus on usage, actually using the, the blockchain is what set EOS aside and what set Dan Larimer's mm -hmm. projects aside from any other in the crypto ecosystem right from the start. Um, so the more that we focus on that, the better. Absolutely. So mad props to EOS New York for creating that. Yeah. I can't EOS wait to order. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to order the EOS New York hardware wallet for sure. Uh, yeah, props mm. to them. I mean, they always surprise me. They 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 do so much. Um, yeah, and Kevin Rose is always a pleasure to talk to. So, um, props to them mm. on that. Um, the uh, so you mentioned the biometrics. That's something I'm really excited for. This idea that um, right now there's a big hurdle with this private these private keys and and key management and and just the risk of even with EOS, it's a small risk, just the risk of somehow losing your keys or getting them stolen is so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of nerve wracking, especially if you, like you took your other crypto and put it all into EOS, <laughs> you know, like you don't want, you gotta be, uh, you know, you gotta be wary. So um, the biometrics, I picture kind of hopefully the solution, the block one comes out at some point has like a thumbprint and maybe a retina scanner or a face scan and a, you know, uh, a couple biometrics that, that verify. Um, and then on top of that, so uh, the uh, privacy coin just came out. So that, that sounds, that seems really cool to me, this idea of just logging in maybe with your thumb and your cell phone and then having a privacy coin where your transactions can be private. All of a sudden that seems like real ownership over your blockchain identity and money and a real game changer. That's, that's exciting for me. Uh, have you heard about the privacy coin? It, I just saw the white paper on it uh, today. So I've, I've heard of it. Um, I haven't looked too much into it yet, but if we draw an analogy between that and, you know, something like Monero where we basically have uh, transactions, which are verifiable, like you can see a transaction exists, but you can't see necessarily where it's gone. Uh, so in the spirit of uh, zero knowledge proofs, yeah, it's fantastic and has really good implications for you could have, you know, like a private account that you use for everyday transactions. So, um, you know, when you, when you go somewhere and you plug your EOS Metro in um, and you make a transaction, you know, that person that you made the transaction with. So like, for example, if you were to go to a, let's say you go to the, the shop and you, and you buy some groceries and you plug in your EOS Metro and you authorize the transaction biometrically, maybe put a PIN number in as well. And then it sends the EOS to the retailer for the purchase that you just made. Now, that transaction itself would be verifiable, but then um, they can't see your account and who you actually are. Because if they could see, you know, CryptoTim.x, which is one of my accounts, they could automatically see it was me. And they can look me up on YouTube and then they can see... Um, who I am, and then they have all this information about me just because I made one transaction. You know, that's not very good for privacy. And even if it's not a, you know, premium name like CryptoTim.e, you know, uh, you could see who the account was and then maybe, you know, look at all of their other spending and then you would know how to market to them and all this sorts of stuff. So it becomes privacy issues even if you're not uniquely identified, even if you're not identifiable as a person. Um, that that um, that retailer now has a lot of information about you. Uh, so I could see definitely there's always really good room for a privacy coin in EOS. And even if we're talking, especially if we're talking about something like UBI, uh, universal basic income. So if you were to receive uh, some kind of UBI on a weekly basis, let's say you would get, I don't know, 20 EOS or something like this, right? You could have as a sort of, side chain, um, a privacy coin. So your EOS would sort of 
through IBC or something like that uh, would then pay into that account. So you can see verifiably on the blockchain that you received the UBI for that week. Uh, but then as you transferred it out of that privacy account into your other account that you have for savings or something like that, nobody could see where, what happened to it when it left that privacy account. They could see that the transaction existed, that you sent it away, but they can't see where it went. Uh, so this has really important implications because you wouldn't want, because with UBI, you would be identifiable as a person. Uh, that's the only way that you would make UBI unique. Uh, because we need to say, okay, this person received this UBI on this week. Uh, so uh, that needs to be in some way, shape or form identifiable to make sure that people aren't duplicating on UBI and stuff like that. So we wouldn't then want that linked to everything else that they're doing um, with their digital money online. If they're gambling, if they're buying these groceries, all sorts of that, those sorts of things, because then that's just privacy out of the window. So you could have that like as a sub account or, or, or some kind of side chain that sort of works in with EOS and those kinds of things. I think that's, yeah, it's a really great initiative if you think about it like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way to think about it. And it is, uh, I, re I read the white paper and it is like Monero. It's kind of like the Monero approach with uh, ring signatures and uh, zero knowledge proofs, like you're saying. And it's, <clears throat> The main point about this, I think, is the point you're making is that when people think about privacy coins, they're like, oh, so that you can do like big hidden transactions and launder money and do nefarious stuff. It's like that's not really at the core of what the privacy issue is about. It's about the little stuff. It's about like you're saying, you take your EOS New York Metro, we'll continue to plug that hardware wallet into the store and, uh, you know, you... Um, and you use it and it's these small transactions where you don't want your entire purchase history if you, on the blockchain searchable by the grocery store or by, you know, when you uh, make a $5 bet with your friend about a football game or, you know, you, you don't want every transaction searchable. That's part of what blockchain is fixing is that um, all of our metadata is, is just freely floating around and being used. Um, whereas, uh, it's not so kind of shifting here. It's not so bad that our metadata is used. It's what's, what's rough about it is that we have no say over how it gets used and we get no value for our data. And so that's where this kind of changes is all of a sudden this privacy token, all these small transactions, we have control over them and maybe we'll let them out, but, may, but maybe we want some sort of uh, compensation for that, or maybe we never want to let them out at all, but it's kind of our property. And that is, that's that's what a privacy coin is for, you know, not for some big bad transactions that you want to hide, you know. So mm, absolutely, yeah, definitely, hundred percent. So it's it's so important to give people choice and inform them. So people don't mind like uh, switching a little bit, going back to the the block one thing. So nobody minded so much that like they were buying a coin that said it had no, that would necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have any value and that block one wouldn't, you know, launch a chain and these kinds of things because they were upfront about it. But if block one said we are launching EOS chain and your coin will definitely have value in these kinds of things, um, does have value. So that wouldn't be so much, but if block one were, if when you're deceptive, like everybody started to dislike, really dislike Facebook after the last scandal that, it, that was where they, sold your data for the political campaign because they didn't disclose and it, that's deception. Not disclosing is deception. Um, so give people a choice and let them be informed that their data is going to be used by marketing companies to sell them things. Then they're fine with it. But if you just do it and not tell them about it or not give them a choice, that makes all the difference in the world because some people just, no matter what you give them, they don't want their data used. You know, they're private kind of people. So let them, let them give, give the choice. And uh, if you ever watch Andreas Antonopoulos, he's absolutely fantastic, a really intelligent man. He said that um, when, uh, when, um, when it's a crime to have privacy, only criminals will have privacy. Mm -hmm. So that basically means that um, when you 
a little bit like in Australia. We, in Australia, we made it illegal to pay for something with cash over ten thousand dollars. So if I buy, go and buy a second-hand car from a second-hand car yard for fifteen thousand dollars, I can't take fifteen thousand dollars out of the bank and pay for the car with cash. That's a criminal offence. Hmm. I've just done an everyday transaction, right, with government money, and I'm now a criminal. Hmm. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. So, and why are they doing this? So they they can track everything. Yeah. So they can be big brother and look over everybody and see what you're doing on absolutely everything. So, but the criminals who are already paying for drugs, right, that they're importing into the country with cash, are not going to stop using cash, mm -hmm. right, because it's a crime anyway. So who, who, that, they don't care. How does that affect anybody? How is that good for anybody? I don't see. Because the criminals that are already using cash are not going to go, oh, shit, it's illegal to use cash for our illegal activities now. Better stop. Yeah. Quick, let's go to CBA and initiate a transfer. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. That I mean, that's that's a that's a great point, man. That's a great point. It's 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 almost like um, blockchain's coming at the perfect time. It's kind of a lot of these issues have come to a head. A lot of this has gotten to the point where people want some sort of solution. Where people are saying, you know what? Like now, with all this privacy issues, and you wanting to know you know, any purchase that I make, you want it to be electronically traceable. And now, you know, with all of our data out there, like people are now thinking this has gone too far. And so I think that blockchain and all these solutions are coming at such an opportune time um, when people want a solution. Anything that's going to be, if it's as good and as easy to use, people will make the switch because there's a pain point there for them now. Um, they're still not, most people still won't do it. Uh, like we have uh, ahead of the curve, but once it gets easier, people are going to start making the switch for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And on privacy, to sort of go off the all over the news now is the J.P. Morgan coin mm -hmm. that was just announced, J.P.M. Mm -hmm. coin. So, um, for me, right, um, there's a lot of controversy, but I say finally it's here because I've been waiting. Yeah. I have been waiting, waiting for this day to come and it's finally come. And look, it's not bullish for crypto, right? But it's not bad for crypto either. I think it's actually an important progression. Mm -hmm. um, and I use, I use that term very specifically because people see what it's, it's essentially no different to what the banks are currently doing now. They're just going to be using a blockchain. But then you might say, but it's a private blockchain, so then they can alter it however they want. So how is that different to a centralized database? So if you have all of the different large banks, let's just say for a start off, they're doing international transfers um, from Australia to the US, right? Just that one specific thing uh, on this JP Morgan coin. Right, so then you say, well, but J.P. Morgan in America and Australia can alter the blockchain. Yeah, but it's not going to be just J.P. Morgan because there's lots of banks and they're all intertwined together. Like you need to get everybody to agree on something to make a transfer. So they're using sort of an unofficial, um, or a not really blockchain right now, but they're all agreeing on a shared truth. And I know this. I used to work in a bank as an accountant, so everybody has a shared truth that they're using. Like this bank has this much money. This bank has this much money. We're transferring, you know, 10 million today from the U S to Australia and these kinds of things. So now what this is doing is this is taking exactly the same thing that they're doing now and using a blockchain for it. And now what you'll get is you'll get all of the, the different banks that are involved in an Australian, Australian to U S transfer. And it's not just one bank. It's not two banks. They're usually several banks that are um, responsible for transferring money overseas because there's no direct way to, can, to transfer money overseas right now. You have to send it like when I used to work in my bank, we were a small sort of uh, union bank, well, credit union bank. So we'd have to send it to our larger bank. That bank would send it to American Express. Then American Express would send it to JP Morgan. JP Morgan would send it to um, 
uh, an American branch and then that American branch would send it to the other larger bank in America and then it would finally go to the bank where I was actually sending the money in the first place. So you've got all these different steps. Now, there's not that's going to change a little bit, but essentially you're going to have the sort of same thing where we've got all of these different banks with a shared truth on a, but on a blockchain, um, then transferring value from from one place to another. And what it's, what it's going to do is you can't just JP Morgan in America is going to all of a sudden just create, you know, like a million coins for themselves and nobody else is going to have a say for it because everybody else is going to be able to see it on their blockchain. It's probably going to be a limited blockchain. So it won't be visible to us. It'll be only visible to them because it'll sort of be, yeah, it'll be invisible to outsiders and they're, going to say, well, JP Morgan in America just made themselves a million dollars. That's not right, right? And then they're going to tell the regulator and the regulator is going to look at them and they're going to find them and they're going to make them reverse the transaction. So it's going to be regulated. It's going to be just like we have now, but it's using a blockchain. So this means that things are going to be cheaper and, um, and faster. So you're going to be able to have near instant um, transfers overseas. So the JP Morgan coin itself is not real. It, it, it's kind of a crypto. It uses a blockchain, but it's more of an internal unit of account. You're going to, it's not going to be trading on anything. All right. It's just going to transfer value from here to here. And that's it. And the banks are going to have their shared truth and it's all going to be regulated and they won't be able to just put an entry in it because then their government or their regulator is going to say that you can't do that just like they do now. Um, same sort of thing, but we should see some cost decrease. And now that the big banks are, are doing this, now business is going to say, okay, well, blockchain is a real thing now. JP Morgan is doing it. Blockchain is a really real thing that a multi-million dollar, you know, international bank that's used for absolutely everything when it does, comes to money transfers, that's an endorsement of blockchain by one of the largest corporations on earth. So this is an important progression. Um, and don't everybody get carried away with your big brother things and, and you know, all of your, your different tinfoil hat things because it's just going to be business as usual mm -hmm. for everybody. But the cost from, from an end user perspective, the cost to doing an international transfer might come down, right? Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin still has a use case. EOS still has a use case, all of these things. Because now what we're going to see is we're going to see more... Well, similar to what we have now, but it's more options. So we've got endorsement by blockchain by the largest bank in, in the, one of the largest banks in the world. So if you want to own your own money still, if you want to have your own digital assets, then your block, your Bitcoin and your EOS and everything is there. Uh, and you want to, you want to transfer freely um, of your own free will without the, the big banks breathing down your neck. There's still your EOS account. Um, for all of the various things that you use it for, so it, look, it's, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of excited about it. Call me a finance nerd, um, but I think it's it's really important to see, and it's it's actually yeah, it's it's an interesting progression. It's it's very important progression. Yeah, <clears throat> well, that's a great progression. I mean, a description of that from from someone who's actually worked in that area. So that's that's great information right there. Um, yeah, yeah, and. Like I was saying, that's a really cool point. Um, I think it, it reminds me of um, thinking back about like the intranet and the internet. And this is almost like JP Morgan's a, a good example of a, a big company that adopted the intranet. I know, I forget if it was like Cisco or some, some of these big companies were like, oh, this, this internet thing's really useful. Here's a use case within our company for it. And, and, it, and that's kind of like what JP Morgan is doing and it lends a lot of validity like you're saying just the technology itself and it's so cool to see it actually happen because that means they've been developing this now for probably at least a year probably longer um, and then you think about companies like Facebook and Amazon and, and uh, Zuckerberg has mentioned blockchain and they're all working on it so it's kind of maybe at this point where we're gonna see who knows, but there could be some real interesting things on the board for uh, blockchain technology with all these, uh, you know, there's a lot going into it right now. So um, pretty interesting. Mm, absolutely. 
Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. And like on the Facebook thing, like people are waiting for a Facebook coin to, to come out. And all of a sudden this uh, this Facebook coin would be, you know, in your Facebook account, you get an airdrop of 100 Facebook coins and I can send it to other people and, 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 and everything when people like my comment and all this stuff. Like it's not that simple. So the problem, the biggest problem, why crypto works so well when it's decentralized, properly decentralized is because you can't have one centralized entity like a Facebook that hasn't got KYC on all of their customers, all of a sudden handling financial transactions with anybody transacting to any other person across the, across the whole world. Because Facebook is in so many different countries, it's dealing with so many different regulatory bodies. And they've got a report on in various countries so like in australia if a bank sends ten thousand to someone right if there's a transaction they need to report that to the counterterrorism body here in australia so if somebody was to save up a lot of facebook coins and then send it to somebody in uganda then the, the facebook in australia needs to report that to the australian um, authorities um, now that can't happen because facebook is so huge and used by so many people across the world uh, so they've got all this different regulation that needs to happen because they don't have KYC in all of their customers. You can't, they're not just going to turn around and KYC like, you know, a billion people or how many people is that use it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not going to happen. So you're not just going to have all of a sudden Facebook coin come out. Uh, there might be some subtle uses of some kind of Facebook coin uh, within Facebook, uh, some kind of, internal unit to say you know like a like a reddit coin but it might not be liquid out of the system so it doesn't really have a monetary value but you might be able to use it in facebook um for certain services and things within facebook but it's not just going to be like a transfer you know i i, I go and buy you know a uh, hundred facebook coins on on nudex from my eos and then i i start sending it to various people across the world because there's with your centralized entity like Facebook, you've got to comply with all the, the different regulatory bodies that are in your different countries or the executives will go to jail, right? So um, they've got a lot to consider. And it's just that's why they seem to be really slow movers when it comes to these blockchain technologies because there's just so many different regulations when it comes to using these things in, in all the different countries that they're in. Yeah, the reality of... of of something like Facebook coin isn't really there, but I mean, it, the logical progression is for some of their executives or some of their top talent to spin off a, a new company that creates uh, some sort of something separate that then tries to integrate with Facebook. Um, you know who, yeah, that's, I mean, it gets, you can get deep into speculation there, but, uh, but yeah, mm. but you're, but you're definitely right. They're, they're not just going to be, they can't just airdrop coins. That would be a, that'd be, kind of a crazy play but you know on that note telegram with i think 600 million users had an ico and like i haven't followed up on that but i know they raised a bunch of money but i wonder what their plan is because yeah that... they've raised a bunch of money in a in a private pre-sale with no i mean telegram doesn't really have a business model my understanding of telegram is that um the fellow who owns telegram is a, a very wealthy um Russian guy who bought a lot of Bitcoin very early um, in, you know, uh, 2010 or something like that. So he doesn't necessarily, I don't know if Telegram actually makes income or he doesn't really need it or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I really don't see, yeah, it's, that's so weird because I raised all this money and then we haven't heard squat, nothing. Yeah, what an anomaly. Um, because how, how does Telegram make any money? That's a good point. There's no ads. It doesn't cost anything. There's no like bonuses, bonus features or stuff that you buy for a dollar. It's like, I wonder, huh, well, now I've got something to look into. I've never, I never realized yeah. they don't have yeah. a business. Model. Yeah, because that, that, the white paper was apparently leaked. I don't know if it's actually leaked or if it was just mm -hmm. put out there for that Telegram crypto. That was going to that was going to have an ICO, um, and it had all about the founder of Telegram. He's like some mathematical genius that bought like th hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin back in 2010 or something like that. So he created from he sort of created Telegram, to sort of you know have free 
communication with people across the earth. So he was sort of anti-censorship. That was part of his motivation. That's my understanding of it. Um, so, yeah, I just, I, it's weird. It's very weird. It is. Cool. Well, that gives me something to research. That's, again, that's why I do this podcast. I love learning just interesting facts and then figuring out more about what's going on in the world. Um, yeah. So you have a, a switching gears a little bit to the premium names because I think that's pretty interesting. You got a premium name. Um, I haven't got one yet. Can you tell us about that process? And, and yeah. Yeah, it's super simple to get the actual premium name. So go on and do it. Uh, EOSNameService.io. So thank you to Cypherglass for launching it because it's absolutely fantastic what they do for the EOS community. And I love their uh, dedication to the main net specifically. Uh, they're very dedicated. Um, you know, I think they're not uh, producing on any other uh, chains apart from the EOS mainnet. Um, so it's super simple to use. Just go in there and type in the name that you want. So what happens is, is so like uh, somebody has bought and paid like, you know, like $100,000 or something worth of EOS for the X name, right, in a name auction. Now, what that owner of the X gets to do is they get to use put, sell any account with any length of uh, characters and then put dot X and the account will be issued by X, the account name. And then your name has to be something um, dot X. So you could have Tim dot X and the, the less characters they've set on EOS name service, the more you pay for it. So I think Tim dot X is like 50 EOS or something like that. So my crypto Tim was maybe like three or four EOS or something like that. So then once you go and do that, then what it'll do is the account that you logged in with to the EOS name service, uh, your account then uses the key, the private key of that account. So it's sort of like a sub account under that private key. So no new private key, but then your active and owner key are the same. And I think, don't quote me on this, but if you used your active key to log into EOS name service, then your active key, say like on crypto, Tim, when I made it is, um, is the active key for that account that I used to log in. Plus my owner key is now the same. So then when it comes to handling keys, you need to change, if you want to change your active and owner key, then you've got to go and do that again. Um, which then means linking another account on scatter and it's a linked account to the top one. So then when it comes to managing keys, it starts getting a little bit tricky and a little bit involved again, but just the actual process of going in and buying the name service um, is incredibly simple. You just log in with scatter, type in what you want, click buy, scatter comes up. You want to pay this much EOS for it, click yes. And boom, there you are. You've got, you know, you've got your, your um, hate happy, dot x or something like that as a premium name and then you can then use that to go in and, and when you play games then you know happy dot x will come up so cool. yeah. Cool. <clears throat> yeah you'll have to check that yeah. out so you, it's, it's very cool it's so much is so much is happening in the eos ecosystem that like every day i try to try out one thing or you know i just I, I dig in a little bit um so then i just haven't got to the name services yet but uh but i'll yeah i'll definitely go do that um, mm. I have, I have a 12 character name. I have Mr. Happy money. Um, so that's my, that's my 12 character name. Actually a little shout out. I have a proxy, um, for block producers cause I interview so many block producers and that's my proxy is uh, Mr. Happy money. So just in case mm -hmm. any, uh, any proxy people are out there. Um, so one of the ones that's coming out, I'm excited about, and it might be useful for you too, is a uh, Patreon. So have you looked into that at all? Yeah, I was actually having a really good discussion last night in Patreon because they did the airdrop and I was meaning to cover it um, in an episode. So I finally went in and did it, um, was doing some research in, and I read the white paper and the, the, I'm chatting with the team now about the detail that's in the white paper because it was incredibly light on detail. Uh, so my understanding first was that uh, Patreon was hosting the content. So they were like a YouTube, right? where or you know like a steam it or something like that where they were going to host the content on the blockchain or host the hash of say like a video or something on the blockchain and their people would be able to subscribe to you and, and pay you 
for your content as like a subscription service through Patreon. And that had the added bonus of, and like Patreon, like we've seen, um, they uh, cut people off. They cut people's subscription off um, because the payment providers didn't like like, like, for example, what Jordan Peterson was doing or things like that. But after chatting with the team, now I've substantiated what, and this is a very important point, and um, you need to focus on this when you, if you ever read the white paper. So what they're providing is only um, a censorship-resistant uh, subscription method. So I would say, for example, for us, we would still have a YouTube channel like normal, but if people want to pay us, you know, like a weekly fee, a weekly subscription service, um, donate to the channel, they would go then through Patreon and then they would pay um, through their Patreon coin. And I think they're making it available to do with EOS and things like that in the future. And you need to have a certain amount staked. So only the payment itself is censorship resistant. So if somebody, if the government decides that they don't like Jordison Peterson, and his YouTube videos, they can still go to YouTube and they go, shut him down. So that doesn't form part of the censorship resistance. Uh, only the payments um, are censorship resistant, which I think is a very important, is a very important part because it's, there's so many difficulties when it comes to saying that all of the content is uncensorable is censorship resistant because then we have run, you run into problems where if somebody posts something like uh, on steam it, there was the dark overlord that was extorting money from companies with data that they'd stole and saying, you need to give us, you know, like a million dollars in Bitcoin or we're going to expose everything. And then steam it, the centralized company actually uh, censored the um, censored the articles that they posted um, on steam it. Now they didn't, overwrite the data that's on the blockchain because of course you can't censor that, but you could no longer search it or find it on steam it itself, which means it's basically gone. Um, it, another platform, you could still reach it on another platform that access steam it, but of course then who's going to see it? You know what I mean? If all of the steam it users aren't going um, on there and they're not seeing it. Uh, so you run into all of these different issues when you're saying we're going to have a content platform where you can't censor things because there's always some things that people don't want to see. You know, nobody wants to see real violence online. You know, nobody wants to go on YouTube and see someone being stabbed. You know, that's just horrible. And nobody wants to host that sort of content. You run into big legal problems. Um, anything, you know, more horrible than that. Um, as well, you don't want to see this. So there's always limits to how censorship resistant people want content to be. But if you're saying that Patreon is just a service where you can pay people for the content that they like, well, nobody's going to, hopefully nobody's going to um, pay for, you know, vulgar or horrible, you know, content that somebody is producing on a regular basis through another you know, YouTube or something like that, because they have to get through the YouTube hurdles to be able to publish the content in the first place. And then I don't think anybody's going to pay for that content either. Hopefully not. Um, or if they do, they won't do it on like a service that's so open, like something like YouTube or something like that would be restricted to the dark net, which, you know, they're hardly going to go to Patreon and say, here, pay us for this on really an open forum. So, look, I think Patreon is fantastic now that I've talked to the team a little bit more and hopefully they're going to update the, the white paper with more information that's on it. Uh, but I think it's going to be a fantastic service and um, I'm going to look into definitely start using it for my channel and I probably suggest that you do the same, look into it. Uh, because did you get your uh, Patreon air, airdrop? Yeah, you know what? I haven't looked yet, but I had I uh, am voting. It looked like you're supposed to be voting, and you received the airdrop. So I think I have. Um, when was the snapshot? Do you know? Was it just two days ago, or, or yesterday, or did they take a snapshot way previously? <clears throat> All right, you're back. Um, you you dropped out for a sec there. Oh, I missed that bit. Oh no problem. I was wondering. Uh, yes, I was voting, so I believe I uh, received the. Uh, I believe I received the airdrop. I haven't checked yet. I was asking if you know when the snapshot was. 
Uh, the no, I'm not sure when the snapshot was, but I think it's just a like it's a predetermined amount because I got the amount in two separate accounts, and oh, okay. I think it was pretty much a similar amount, but the amount of EOS that I had in each account was was significantly different. So mm. I think it's just like a almost like a standard amount. Okay. Um, so it's not necessarily yeah. Interesting. So it's, yes, yeah, exciting. Yeah, that's, I, I'm excited about that. It's cool that it's in e, EOS too. It, that's, that's cool. Uh, mm. Have you used Patreon itself? Um, and are you familiar no, with that platform? No, I haven't either. I'm I, was, wondering, I, was, yeah. I, was, I was thinking about doing it for, to let people um, you know, uh, contribute to the channel, but then like all of these things take a lot of work. And then I heard of Patri EOS that came out. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to wait for this to come out. And if it's good, then, then look into using that. So yeah, um, more power to them because as crypto people, you still do worry that someone like YouTube or someone is, is going to come along and say, no, we can't monetize this because Visa told us not to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah it, is, it is. You do run that risk. Um, and mm. I, I wonder if uh, Patreon, I, I wonder if Patreon has YouTube host their videos or if they have their own host, if they host them themselves. Um, I but yeah, I was yeah. doing the same thing as you just waiting for Patreos mm. before I put the work into spinning it up. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, everybody, um, go on to telegram chat, have a chat to the team. Uh, they're really good. Answer lots of questions. Uh, but to the team, definitely update the white paper, get some more detail in there. Uh, because it's a really big thing what you're doing. So it should be taken very seriously. And us as content creators put a lot of time and effort. Um, and our lives, we pour it into our, our platform. So we want to know that a platform is really good and it's really serious, solid platform before we go and put ourselves on it and say that, yeah, we endorse this platform by going onto it. We think that it's good. Um, we're willing to, to take payments through it, you know, to invest our, our time and, and effort into creating that resource um, and linking it to our channel. Yeah, I mean, with the right user interface and, it, and if it works well, I mean, that's just such a killer tool that will definitely be adopted by, um, you know, the content creators on EOS, I'm sure. And it, it's something I would support for sure. I, I had a, I used back in the Steemit days, I used DTube, which was this really cool idea, basically a decentralized YouTube. It moved to another blockchain now, um, but it was so there's only so much work you can put in. You're already putting a ton of work into producing content. And then that, that site was just so rough that uh, I eventually stopped using it. But um, I think that crypto EOS people will do a lot to use a EOS specific Patreos. And uh, if it's smooth, they'll definitely use it. But uh, yeah, DTube, DTube was rough for me. I had to stop using it eventually. So yeah, I tried to use DTube as well. It was, yeah, like a, like you said, it was bad. Um, once I was uploading videos in there, one time I uploaded a video and I chose the wrong thumbnail for it and then I couldn't change the thumbnail. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I understand it's blockchain and everything, but come on, guys, like, you know, just create another image and then link the hash to that image or something like that, you know, like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, YouTube, Google is such a big multi-billion dollar, you know, international company to then say this little DTube is going to come up, all right, and compete with Google and YouTube. You got to be kidding. You know, <laughs> it needs to be a, a really big, serious, it's a really big, serious thing hosting a video platform. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it, we it just... Yeah, you got to think from from a business perspective. I mean, and now we're crypto, and we like to see these new different things going on in the sort of crypto world. But it's a it's a business, you know, and it's a startup business, so it takes a lot of time, investment, and money and resources. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, the I, so as we start to wind down here, I just wanted to touch on sister chains again because part of the reason that uh, you know I, when I first reached out to you was I you did a video covering one of our articles, and I was like, how how come I haven't had Crypto Tim on the show yet? I've, I've, unbelievably hadn't met you yet. So that was kind of like, I got to contact him for you. But anyway, just to address that, so I don't just like gloss over the, uh, what spurred me to bring you here. Um, we had, I had written an article uh, for our block producer about uh, boss 
chain. And that's why I wanted to talk about sister chains a little bit. Um, and so I'll just give my brief overview to see if you have any input. Um, but I am an advocate of sister chains because I like some healthy competition. Um, your point about the community kind of needing to center around um, the main net, I, 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 I agree with to some extent. I, I like the competition um, as kind of a safety net to make sure, keep everyone honest, basically. Uh, the main thing with boss was I don't know. And, and so like, it's not, it's not that it is a scam. It's just that the burden of proof really falls on these sister chains or these ones that come out to say like, here's all our information. This is who we are and what we're doing. Um, and if that's not there, uh, then, then it's, then it's a, then how are we supposed to endorse it or get behind it? And so, um, yeah, the reason I ended up writing that article is because we did, we just, we jumped on board cause we were just like, Oh, well let's experiment, you know, with our block producer and we're going to support people experimenting. And then we had a meeting, we kind of started to dig into it and we just had so many unanswered questions and it's like, shit, we, we jumped into this a little bit earlier. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the story between us putting up that node and supporting that blockchain and then removing support. Um, not a big scandal or anything, just we needed, we're all about transparency. So we needed to just explain ourselves, be like, Hey, we, we jumped in a little bit early here. So um, yeah, I really don't know anything about boss chain, but can't support them because of the, the lack of transparency. So um, yeah, that re it really says something if a block producer, you know, that's producing blocks doesn't know about the chain that they're producing blocks for. Cause then how is anybody else meant to know? Seriously? Like, how is the everyday average token holder, you know, meant to know? Mm -hmm. um, and disclosure is so important in the crypto world and being honest with people because it's a big bad world out there. You're, you know, your entire EOS account can go, can get stolen, you know, within a matter of half a second block time. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really important that like all the chains, all the dApps, all the apps, everything discloses to people and is really open with people about what they want to do. Um, and it's not deceptive in the way that they conduct themselves. Otherwise, you know, we can be just as bad as the centralized entities that we're trying to replace. So if you want to be a private chain, then say you want to be a private chain and, you know, and be open about it and tell people exactly what your intentions are and tell people that you want to be a business blockchain. You know, um, if you disclose people and are honest with people about your intentions, then they don't mind, you know, then you'll have people using it. You'll have people um, investing in it, all these sorts of things. But if you are being sketchy on detail and not being open with people and not telling people your full intentions and saying you're being an open blockchain, but then distributing coins more like it's a private, um, a private blockchain where, you know, one central entity controls, you know, nearly 80% of the coins then that contradicts what you're trying to say about being an open and public blockchain. And people don't like that. Um, mm -hmm. People don't like deception. So disclosure, disclosure, tell people, you know, give people your vision. You know, if you, you have a vision of a private blockchain, then sell people your vision, tell people exactly what you want to do. People will, people will understand that and they'll get behind it and they'll say, we want to experiment with this. Then, then go ahead and do it. You know what I mean? Um, you, you know, yeah, it's all about, it's all about honesty and people really appreciate it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to me, I think Warbly is a good example of, um, a business blockchain who's kind of said, you know, we're, we are going to do a AML KYC and, uh, some people are going to like it. Some people aren't, we're trying, you know, and they've been open about what they're doing. So they're kind of one of the blockchains. Yeah. It's like agree or disagree. Like, fine, go, go, go see what you can do, you know? So, um, yeah, they're kind of a good exactly. example. And the other end of the chain that I think did a good job with that. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just quickly on, on Wobbly, like everybody really appreciated the, the open and honest they were doing KYC, what they're going to do, their business blockchain, these kinds of things. Um, but then just to, to then say we're doing a share drop and give a date that they're closing it and then, have a non-functioning KYC and then all of a sudden close the share drop within three hours notice, which is basically like immediately, um, which seemed to be completely contradictory to what you were doing before. Um, that caught a lot of people offside, you know, including myself, because that 
is a departure from the honesty that they were displaying earlier on, which is why I was, I was behind them before, you know, um, I interviewed the CEO. Um, I was talking about them on my channel and now I'm, I'm not covering any of their content anymore because, you know, they've, they've, just that that one action was more deceptive than it was sort of open and honest. So that was that was unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's almost like um, it would do them well to give some like real in depth explanation of exactly how that decision was made, because uh, again, it's this it's it's this thing where we just don't have all the information. We don't know. It sounds like they were within some negotiations or some talks, but then all of a sudden that there's not quite enough information there to say, okay, well, why was it closed within three hours? You know, because if they would have closed it within 48 hours, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, they were doing a business deal. They had to get this done and, you know, and they let us know, but the three hour thing, it's like, if the window was a little longer, then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, thanks for being transparent. Like business is business. But, uh, with it being so short, they, they kind of need to give some more detail there of either we just made it short because it was easier for us or uh, we had to because, because we were literally about to sign the papers. Like if they come out and say exactly what it was, then, uh, you know, that, again, it's this, it's this transparency theme and that's what I think the whole blockchain space really appreciates. So, um, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there's some, there's so many scams out there in blockchain and people get sick of deception and, you know, uh, scammers trying to take their money by pretending they're somebody they're not creating fake sites, all of this stuff. You have all this deception everywhere in crypto. So if you are a real genuine blockchain project, like Warbly is, you know, it's trying to be the central financial services for EOS and you want to engage the EOS community by having a share drop for everybody then you need to be open with that community. If you don't want to engage the community by not doing a share drop, then you don't need to be open with everybody, you know, but if you're saying you don't do one thing and it ends up being something else, yeah, people don't appreciate it. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, we've, we've got a, a epic podcast going here. This has been, this has been really fun. Um, yeah. Didn't disappoint for sure. It's been, you know, it's been a pleasure to chat with you about all kinds of stuff and I'd love to uh, do it again because I mean, a month from now, there'll be a whole new slate of interesting stuff going on in EOS that uh, is brand new. So um, you got an open invite to come back on the show. As we as we kind of wind down here, did you have any final thoughts, anything, any other apps we skipped over, anything that you wanted to mention? Oh, look, there's, there's tons of things to mention. Uh, but I will sort of close on this. And, and that's to say to everybody, don't stop learning, you know, just keep learning about EOS, keep trying different things. If you experiment with different apps and different dApps and, and experiment with, you know, going to different websites and being the first one to try a new app, do it with a separate account and stay safe, you know, put a little bit of EOS. So if your account gets compromised because you're trying new things, we love trying new things on EOS. Don't stop trying new things. Just make sure you know how to stay safe before you go and do it. Uh, you know, I've got my main amount of EOS on a Ledger hardware wallet because right now that's the safest way to keep my main stash. And then I've got a smaller amount in an account, which I go and I have some fun and I, I experiment with new things. So never stop learning, stay safe. And, you know, uh, yeah, listen to as much EOS uh, and crypto things that are out there to learn as much as you possibly can while we're in the early sort of DOS stage and stay stay patient there's all new developments happening all the time so yeah yeah, yeah it's it's uh, all kinds of interesting developments um on my end i've got mr happy money the proxy where i interview block producers i talk to them and i vote for the ones that uh hold the standard mostly i look for transparency and, and adding a lot to the community and uh and i get to know the teams pretty well by talking to them for a couple hours so um Mr. Happy Money Proxy, got a block producer as well, EO San Francisco, and uh, we're all about building community in the Silicon Valley, and that's going way well, um, so check us out. And uh, Crypto Tim, you have an awesome YouTube channel, some of my favorite content, short and sweet, and uh, what's breaking news, so uh, check out Crypto Tim's YouTube channel, and where else can people find you, uh, Tim, on the, on the socials, or where's the best place for them to see you? 
Yeah, so you can catch me on Telegram. I'm on Life Liberty Crypto, or I also have a Crypto Tim uh, Telegram chat room, my own. Um, catch me on Twitter. I think I'm. Let's, let's just double Oz check. Um, Oz Crypto Tim. That's it on Twitter. I'm I'm always on there. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you can. That's that's my main ones, definitely. Cool, and. Uh, the EOS podcast, this is a podcast too, not just a wonderful YouTube channel where you get to see people like Crypto Tim, but uh, the podcast. So when you're working or when you're driving to work, you can listen. Mostly when you're working, you should be listening to EOS stuff and you can learn for eight hours a day. <laughs> so um, that, that's, yeah, that's it for today. So uh, farewell, my EOS friends. Tim, mm. say farewell. And Thanks, y'all. Thanks yep. so much. Brandon. That's the end. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. The money is not the prime asset in life. Time is, and uh, your time is. Just-